Dear guests, welcome to the session called Inclusive Corporate Culture. My name is Nevgül Bilsad Safkan. I'm the general manager of Sabancı Foundation in Turkey. For those who cannot see me, I'm a white woman with brown hair and green eyes. I'm wearing a pink based colored uh, blues with circles on it in blue, red and yellow colors. I'm wearing a um, necklace with an evil eye and I have small golden earrings. Today I will be moderating the session. We will focus on successful diversity and inclusion practices in corporate culture. We'll learn more about two great examples from around the world. Our session will be a multilingual session. We will be using English, Spanish, and international side. You can choose your language from the interpretation section below. Before starting the discussion, I would like to share a few words about my company, Sabanji Foundation. It is one of the biggest family foundations in Turkey. Since 1974, we've been contributing to Turkey's social development, especially in areas education, arts and culture, and social change. Through our scholarships, institutions, and grant programs, we've been supporting women, youth, and people with disabilities to participate in all aspects of life. To be honest to you, we are a big fan of Zero Project Conference. We've been joining the conference since 2013, and we are following the Zero Project Latin America Conference since its first year, 2018. The Zero Project is a big, great inspiration for us. We also organized similar version of the conference in Istanbul, invited many innovative projects that we met at the Zero Project Conference in Vienna. So moderating a panel in Latin America and seeing that impact of Zero Project has expanded borders is very exciting for us. Number of studies of future of work have increased with the pandemic, but diversity and inclusion have already been discussed a lot in HR literature for many years. To start with definitions of these similar concepts, diversity and inclusion. Diversity is about who you are working with. It focuses on the issue just by using numbers. Whereas inclusion is about how people feel and participate the decision process. Diversity is necessary, but not sufficient for inclusion. For example, in terms of disability, ensuring diversity can be possible by recruitment, but if they're not supported by assisted, assistive technologies or they're not included in decision-making processes, this is not inclusion. In a more broad sense, inclusion requires a cultural shift. And today we'll talk more on inclusion. Besides being a basic human right, an important concept for equal participation in society, inclusion has also a significant part for the economic growth because inclusion increases productivity, creativity, and innovation. Also, to ensure the products or services accessibility and usability for all, having a diverse team makes a difference. To give some numbers, according to 
2018 study by Deloitte, which is one of the largest consultancy companies, working in diverse teams increases innovation by 20%, decreases the risk of making wrong decisions by 30% due to diversity of thinking. Additionally, organizations with inclusive cultures are three times as likely to be high performing and, I, and, and eight times more likely to achieve better business outcomes. For this reason, diversity and inclusion. This issue should be handled as an everyone's issue instead of a corporate social responsibility practice. While seeing benefits for both sides and breaking down the stigmas, focusing not only on diversity of the workplace, but also on inclusive culture is another key point. I would like to share a sample project which was supported by our grant program. A sub foundation to promote inclusion and equal participation in society, we're supporting right-based NGOs working on disability rights, inclusive education, and independent living by our grant program. Our 2015 and 2016 grantee, Down Syndrome Association, conducted a two years long project to promote employment of people with disabilities and creating a job coaching model. During the project, to ensure both diversity and inclusion, 24 four people with disabilities were recruited in different sectors. Disability awareness, trainings for organizations, and a job coaching program for the disabled were held. The, these were about my presentation, so I would like to stop it for a moment. Now we are uh, approaching to the more exciting part to the session where I'm gonna have two uh, panelists with me, uh, very uh, inspiring examples uh, we will listen. I would like to start introducing one by one. My first introduction is Amena El Sayeh from Egypt. I would like to say a few words about Amena and the Helm Consulting, uh, which she represents. Helm means hope in English. The consultancy was established in 2014, and Amena is the CEO and the co-founder of the Helm Consulting since the establishment. They are promoting inclusion of persons with disabilities in workplaces, providing accessibility and inclusion coaching services. Their consultancy uh, includes the recruitment process. It includes accessible workplace, uh, trainings about diversity and inclusion. And they have some very well-known partners such as Microsoft, Vodafone, PepsiCo, ILO. And uh, Helm Consulting was selected in Zero Project Impact Transfer Program for 2020-2021. So far since 2016, they have completed over 1,000 accessibility audits and their model was implemented in Egypt, overall, overall in Egypt, in more than 200 organizations. So 
So here we listen to Amena. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Nicole, for uh, moderating the session. And thank you, The Zero Project, uh, for this um, opportunity. Uh, today, I'm here to present the Workplace Inclusive Solutions by Helm uh, in Egypt, uh, where we work in four other countries and looking to expand globally. So HELM, basically our vision is to promote the full inclusion of persons with disabilities in all aspects of life. And we started our journey about 10 years ago. And the main way that we work is that we want businesses and persons with disabilities to be empowered together, to remove all barriers and to empower both persons with disabilities and workplaces and businesses. The way we work is that we understand that there is a 360 model. There are the digital barriers, physical barriers, and social barriers. Together in the workplace and in the business place, we always face these barriers that hinder the recruitment process to be fully and um, completely inclusive. So we cannot work on one and leave the others. And this is what makes a fully inclusive experience for people with disabilities and to avoid all barriers also from people who will interact and work with people with disabilities and serve them as customers. So our main impact that we hope to do is to empower first workplaces, even before marketplaces, to hire and retain persons with disabilities. And we do so by helping organizations to understand what are the physical and digital barriers that they have, and we support them in inclusion requirements. So over the years, we have supported only in the last two years more than 2,700 people with disabilities. And we do that through training, development, and recruitment. And we also work with the other side, which is companies and governments. We have so far been working with 900 clients and over 20 governorates inside Egypt and in four countries and across 12 sectors. Um, so in order to tackle the 360 problem and how we see it, it's a double sided problem from both the employers and businesses, as well as from people with disabilities. So we created a roadmap to help organizations become inclusive. And we do so by training programs through the training Helm Academy. And I'm going to tell you how COVID affected that heavily. And we also have our recruitment support services where we do job analysis and other services, and we have accessibility services. So first of all, when any workplace or business works with us, normally because of the quota uh, for recruitment, a lot of companies need to abide by the law. And therefore, when they approach Helm, what we do is we try to take them a step back. We tell them if it was easy and we do not follow the charity model where we just supply the company with persons with disabilities, but rather we try to bridge the gap between both the job seekers and employers. So we have a very unique process in terms of first understanding standing and doing a job analysis in order to identify the needs of the client. And then once we agree on a job criteria, depending on the number of hirings and the vacancies that we have, we then set a criteria for selection so that we can help find the right calibers and the right fit. And of course, with having the job analysis made, we then uh, prepare a timeline and we start to look for the talent. We do the interviews and we provide them to the client so that they can actually have a successful recruitment. Of course, after COVID, there was an even bigger problem because we knew that a lot of people with disabilities, especially in Egypt and in the Arab world, might have a deficiency in access to proper education. And I know that this is the same in many countries around the world. Due to the lack of accessibility in so many opportunities, what happens in the end is that most of training and development programs and educational programs and even in the end of the day, life is a school. So when we have uh, poor access to different aspects of life, a lot less experiences could lead to um, a gap in the market. And this is why we created Helm Academy. Before COVID, it was a physical academy and we used to graduate thousands of students every year and provide better opportunities to the workplace. But what happened is that now we had to turn it online because everybody stopped offline training. So in COVID, we completely shifted our business model. And now what we are doing is we provide online Helm Academy, where we provide different training programs, both for persons with disabilities 
and also employers, because even employers, they need their teams and their staff to have inclusive training, to understand the different, um, the difference uh, between uh, accommodations in the workplace per person, and that it's not about a one size fit all, and to better understand disability, inclusion, and what the role is in the society. So we also fortify that with accessibility services. So basically what we, we, we do is once we do an analysis, we do an achievable barrier removal process for physical and technological barriers. And we support businesses to understand what kind of barriers they need to remove from the workplace. And accordingly, we provide the support while they are implementing the changes from the business's side. These are some of the accessibility models on the screen. You, you, can, uh, you will see that there is a platform that has tactile blocks being installed. There's another picture that has uh, stairs and then there's a ramp installed. The ramp in installed is for businesses. And for the metro stations, we actually have, we actually have the uh, tactile blocks uh, that are installed for metro stations. And therefore, uh, we are going to, uh, this is, these are only examples of more than 1,000 places that we have supported to become more accessible and inclusive, whether from the governmental side or the uh, public uh, private side. So this is from uh, the banking sector, the example with the ramp that they installed after we did the audit, and the other example on the screen is of the metro stations. Again, we have great case studies of not only serving people with disabilities, but also recruitment. So the models that we do when we create the hybrid 360 model is that eventually we, you will see that uh, we have uh, great examples in multinationals after COVID, such as with Mars, we actually created a special online program for candidates in Mars to be trained and developed to be ready for the workplace. We also work not only on full-time employment, but with trainees, and we encourage the graduates from our academy programs to have uh, further development programs. So far, we have supported more than 1,000 assessments of buildings and across 20 governates in 10 sectors. We also try to be creative in ways to convince our partners and businesses to learn from each other so that instead of us trying to convince companies that our model works, we let them speak for themselves. So we created right before COVID a conference, uh, um, a career day where we had 1,000 job seekers from all across Asia. We involved 30 employers, engaged DPOs and NGOs, and we even involved the government with the different ministries so that there can be a cross-reference and learning. In the end of the day, we support to create impact for employees in corporates. We help auditing buildings as well as technological aspects, and we also support in training and recruitment. Um, some, of the, some of the best partners that we have are Vodafone Egypt Foundation, and we have great feedback from, from a partnership that lasted for more than five years, where also we have uh, another example from Henkel and how it supported them to do inclusion in their workplace. These are, these are just two examples of many other uh, entities that we intend to support, and we are looking for partnerships from around the world, and uh, we would love to work with countries in Latin America to share our model that actually is a part of the impact transfer program uh, in 2021 with the Zero Project um, and Ashoka. And we would love to replicate our model uh, in different places around the world. So thank you so much. Thank you, Amena, for your presentation and all the very interesting and inspiring work you have performed. Thank you. Now I would like to pass the word to my second <clears throat> speaker, Katya Berdicheski from Scotia Bank. Uh, before I uh, uh, hand over to uh, Katya, I would like to say a few words about Scotia Bank, which was established in 1832 in Canada. The bank has more than 20 million customers and uh, about 88,000 employees. When we look at the bank's page about diversity and inclusion, the content there consists uh, about uh, uh, the content is so rich and it covers 
indigenous people, veterans, persons with disabilities, black people, women, and LGBTI plus. The bank has a very uh, high rate about uh, disa disabled employees, which is around 7%. But more interesting is the objective to reach 20% by the year 2025. The bank is coordinating all its efforts with customers with disabilities so that the mobile banking app is so rich and it includes the color contrast, the adjustable font size, the large buttons for persons with limited motor abilities. And uh, we're not used to see such features in the mobile bank apps uh, actually. And what we, uh, we were surprised to see also that there are so many awards, more than 60 awards on diversity and inclusion works the bank achieved, mostly from Great Place to Work Institute. So I'm very interested to listen more. So Katya, welcome, and it's your word now. Muchas gracias, Nebgul, por tu presentación. Thank you very much, Nebgul, for your presentation. We're very happy as Scotiabank Chile to be able to share with you and to be able to participate in the seminar to talk about the inclusive culture that our bank has. As you know, Scotiabank Chile is a Canadian bank that has more than 190 years of history, and it's in our country from 1990. Diversity and inclusion is part of our business strategy. Basically, we have a total of 98,000 collaborators globally that come from 120 um, countries, and they, uh, they speak 100 different languages. So inclusive culture is fundamental so that they can develop their whole potential. And the, our main principles on uh, diversity is to listen to educate act and sustain and our focus from inclusion is beyond gender equality which is something that we do consider of course but we also consider the inclusion of people with disabilities cultural diversity and also the lgbti plus inclusion The context of disabilities in Chile is very important to understand what is the situation that we're living today. Today, the 20% of the population with 18 or more years old has some degree of disability. So it's about 2.6 million people with disabilities in Chile. And we have two laws here that in a way talk about inclusion of people with disabilities in the companies. It's the law of 2018 and 2020 that along with incorporating and figure a number of collaborators that the companies need to have in proportion to the total amount of workers, we also have a second law, the second act that asks us as a company to have an expert on disability in human resources. So that generates new challenges for the companies in terms of regulations, culture, social aspects, so that if we really want to be relevant in inclusion. Next. And in that context, Scotiabank and the inclusion of uh, people with disabilities, I, our interest in this topic was uh, started beyond before the the acts, the acts, the laws. We had uh, shaped up some group work groups, work groups, and we had considered very relevant to incorporate to our organization to people with disabilities. And the areas where we focused were uh, talent attraction, internal development, procedures, policies, communication, and culture. So how to be able to generate a culture that was open open to inclusion and that educates uh, as well on these topics that in a way could be considered as new accessibility too. So that allowed us to maintain a program in an ongoing way and maintain it when we dealt with important problems with important changes like uh, regulation 
changes the integration with a BBVA bank, for example, and also the social movement. You all, maybe you know that in 2019, we had an important situation nationally, and we are still going through that, and that has implied changes for our country. And also the context of the pandemic that we all know about, how hard it has been, how challenging it has been and where we as a bank focused on trying to maintain a support for our collaborators, accompany them and promoting some services for uh, mental support, psychological support, and also for support for people with disabilities. In this context, and starting from these roundtables that we developed on 2000, in 2015, we needed to generate a program which was Scotia Includes, and we wanted to improve the quality of life of collaborators with disabilities in our organization, and also uh, trying to make adjustments to be able to achieve full inclusion of these people in the company. And this meant to have a program that had some benefits that we had already developed, and incorporate new ones and in the ones that we incorporated we were able to add more uh, leave days for people that needed to go for checkups or for treatments and also uh, supporting them uh, financially speaking for their well-being so for example canes or hearing devices or any other system any other tool that they may need and also uh, transportation so that they could have a monthly support so that they could uh, commute. And we also included something that is called My Best Friend, and this is reimbursing um, payments that they need to make for their uh, accompanying animals, their pets. So that it was very important for this type, for this group of collaborators. Next one, please. In 2020, we decided to go beyond this program and we included a prog programa permanente total. So that means that today our collaborators that uh, have disabilities can work from home five days a week. So this is related to the context that in Chile, there's a new law of telework that allows workers to work from their houses so uh, work from their houses four days a week. And we decided to extend it to five days so that people are uh, happy peace of mind and they can avoid commuting and work absolutely from home. So that's how, what we're doing. And all collaborators that uh, belong to this program, to the Scotia Bank Incluye, can opt for this benefit if they want it so. And with this program, we have had really good results. Uh, in three years, we have increased the 70% of people with disabilities that were hired in our company. And this is a long-term relationship. It's not just to comply with a law. It, a 91% of our collaborators with disabilities have an indefinite um, contract and uh, full day work, and they are 100% in the uh, program Scotiabank Incluye with the benefits that I already talked to you about. So now for you to be able to know a little bit better how this program is, what this program is about, I'm going to look you with a video. In Scotiabank Chile, we promote diversity. all diversity with disabilities. During July, we are going to celebrate the month of diversity. I started with a hearing pro problem a couple of years ago. The truth is that I didn't want to assume it. My disability is a, a visual disability called keratoconus, and it's difficult for me to focus my eyesight because we need to see us through our competencies. That is part of our culture. Two years ago, we created the program Scotiabank Includes, which contemplates benefits such as co-payment of prostheses, one or more days for leaves, uh, telework, amongst others. It was very nice for me to know that the bank could go along with me in this process and in my well-being as well. I am in the process of buying new sunglasses for my disability, and the program Scotiabank Includes reimburses all of these devices that I may need to have a better life at the workplace. 
because differences do not separate us. They put us closer. We invite you to celebrate the month of diversity and keep on creating an inclusive society. Scotiabank. Well, I hope you like this video. This is what we wanted to share with you, how you live in an inclusive culture in Bank Scotiabank, Chile, and how we profoundly feel like we could strengthen the development of all of our collaborators that way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katia. I'm so excited when listening to your banks, uh, all that you have done, so many steps are taken, so many innovative, very important steps for diversity, inclusion, accessibility. Uh, we have listened that you also consulted the people with disabilities during uh, organizing and structuring all your steps and processes. How much do you think is the importance uh, of conducting uh, interviews and uh, meetings with people with uh, people with disabilities when designing new processes, new procedures, innovatives in the working place? How much difference does it make and help you in this process? Yes, we as Scotiabank Chile, we consider that having collaborators with uh, disabilities, diverse collaborators, all of this is part of a culture, a successful culture of how we can develop, better develop the goals of the company, how we can achieve better the goals of the company, which is all based on respect to diversity. As I commented, we have 98,000 collaborators at a global level that come from different countries. Therefore, the realities are very different. We like to uh, tell a lot about our experience that we had with the integration of BB, BB, a Chile and where we base ourselves in respects for diversity, we establish panels to be able to manage our human resources and to capture new talent. We establish gender equity panels for the incorporation of these professionals for the assessment of new professionals. All of that accounted into an improvement of our gender equity rate going from 18% at a level of vice presidents and senior vice presidents to 24% in gender equity, for example. And as I commented, we increased 70% on in our staff with disabilities within the organization. Therefore, clearly for all of our processes and for us, we do consider that people and their diverse conception, they are critical for the success of organizations such as ours. Yeah, I would like to ask you now about your predictions about the future of work, Katia. Sí, bueno, ha sido muy desafiante a partir, obviamente, de la pandemia. This has been quite challenging based on the pandemic that we, all the countries have been through. So that has meant in local reality, different things. In the case of Scotiabank, I think that the pandemic has accelerated processes that we were already facing. And within those processes, I believe that the future, uh, in the future, um, labor or work flexibility will be critical. In the case of the bank, we had already established some remote working processes that we had previously implemented. Therefore, we were able to continue working like that. And we were able to foster that our collaborators, our workers stay at home doing remote working. And this has worked and this has been efficient and it has allowed us to continue fulfilling the goals we have as a bank. In that regard, with people with disabilities, we thought about going beyond and implementing this permanent program for people 
uh, have uh, disabilities for this to be permanent for them to be able to work from their homes therefore i believe that the pandemic now has truly generated new demands that some companies well we had to develop in a prior manner but some other companies had to hop on to uh, this uh, line or this path of remote working a bit late but that, that's the that's where we should go that's our future path flexible work that lets the employee work continue with what we're doing and uh, to achieve the results we expect thank you my third question will be about digital inclusion and digital accessibility. These are emerging topics in relation with digitalization and pandemic. So what are, what are your plans for the future to promote digital inclusion? Digital inclusion is critical for the bank precisely because we have stated our goal of becoming the best digital bank of Chile. Therefore, in coordination with our headquarters in Toronto, we're constantly developing and along with our digital bank in Chile in Santiago, we're developing accessibility improvements to our digital platforms not only in terms of uh, disabilities, but this goes towards, it's aimed towards other groups of the population and the relationship with the digital world is newer. For example, with the elderly or people with other types of disabilities, therefore, we're permanently thinking about this. We're working on it. It's a path that we're currently working on. We're on this and uh, through our, all, our, our headquarters, we are permanently training, having workshops that allow us to understand our future path and to advance to develop products for the benefits of our collaborators and customers Omena, my first question is that you are selected in zero project impact transfer program this year so what are your goals for dissemination? So our plans for Helm for growing and in order to, to be able to spread across other countries um, is basically we're focused on the MENA region. So far we've been providing support in the UAE and Jordan and now in KSA, actually, after um, after COVID, uh, it has been supporting us to grow because we had to shift our business model. Um, so um, I believe that we are looking also forward to learn how we can partner in other continents as well. Um, so we've been exploring opportunities in India and building partnerships so that we can uh, provide our um, online services and training programs to be translated in different languages as well. Um, so, and even now we're being requested to do recruitment in Ireland, which is a new challenge for us, uh, but we're finding that it is not difficult because we've had a 10 years experience in how to uh, partner with the right uh, organizations in each respective country and be able to provide um, persons with disabilities in different countries. So we hope to, to find also in Latin America. My second question is about your predictions about the future of work. Do you think that pandemic has accelerated diversity and inclusion plans in organizations? I believe that the future of work has completely changed after COVID. Uh, looking at what happened to Helm in the last two years, we literally had to shift all our business model to recreate and adapt to digitizing our services and finding ways to uh, pursue uh, inclusion and support organizations to find new solutions that fit for the workplace. Um, but I believe that 
uh, I thought it would impact heavily persons with disabilities recruitment. Uh, a lot of companies have been affected. So um, there has been um, a lot of uh, locations and, and businesses who had to lay off or change their models. But on the other hand, I believe there's a bright future because a lot of other industries have boomed. And therefore, actually, because everybody was in the shoes of people with disabilities with limitations to mobility and limitations to go everywhere um, and to be able to find uh, uh, less opportunities, I think the pandemic um, maybe reflected what a lot of struggles persons with disabilities go through every day. Um, and I believe that through this opportunity, we are building, like we turned this problem into a bigger opportunity now um, to create jobs from home to actually develop new um, uh, opportunities in new industries that are now replacing old industries. Um, so I believe there is an opportunity there that we can utilize and capitalize on. And that doesn't mean that we are not going to still push for an inclusive society and physical accessible locations for people with disabilities. Yes, my third question will be about digital digitalization, digital inclusion and digital accessibility. These are the two emerging topics in relation with digitalization and the pandemic. What are, you, what are your plans for the future to promote the digital inclusion? So our plans for digital inclusion and digital accessibility um, is that we are in fact changing the way our services are being provided. We are investing in developing our platform to serve the biggest number of people with disabilities and clients, uh, as well as businesses and governments. Um, it's not just us. I think it's a trend going everywhere and it even pushed us light years ahead um, in, in, in order to push um, and show that it works, that we can do a lot of work online. Um, and therefore, our future uh, plans involves promoting digital inclusion in all aspects. So now, actually, a lot of the work we're getting, and we had to quickly adapt to provide digital inclusion solutions for companies and to provide companies with alternative um, uh, partnerships that they could do um, and solutions so that they can uh, build their companies and their services that are also going in the direction of digital uh, to become inclusive when they're designing products, services, and, um, and everything that is being created in the world right now. So we hope to have a big influence in the digital transformation uh, of a lot of services happening and as well as internally as an organization. Thank you, Katya, and thank you, Amena. We've been discussing in our session about diversity and inclusion, and I'm sure whoever has listened to us has gained a lot. Thank you for, your, for sharing your experiences with us. Uh, that's the end of our session. I'm uh, hoping to see you all next year in Zero Project Latin America. Thank you guys, bye-bye.